Yeah, well, good afternoon. A very fulsome introduction, whether I can live up to it, I don't know. Um, so my world is very much the world of academia. I've worked in universities for 30 odd years. And my field research was very much sort of enterprise, enterprise development in the early days of micro-enterprise. And that's where I came from, the microcredit in the 80s. And suddenly the NGOs discovered microcredit in the late 80s at the head of the Grameen Bank. He was having got people about the Salvation Army trying to do microcredit, and it was mayhem. Well, they just did not have the skill set, they didn't have the value set, they didn't have the understanding to do it. So I got quite interested very rapidly in the way that NGOs and other agencies were involved in microenterprise. So by the early 90s, I'd switched away from just that world of business, entrepreneurship, microenterprise, enterprise development, microcredit, into the world of the way NGOs, the way donors make decisions and who they fund. And that's really been my world for the last 25 years, um, working with both UN agencies, both a range of donors, a range of foundations, and a gr group of NGOs, both in the South and the North. As I say, Ruth says, I do run a master's program in NGO management um, at a business school. I've always worked in business schools. I've tried working in development study centres once, and it just wasn't for me. I feel much happier in business schools. It's quite a lonely path, though, and not many people who are interested in the management of development agencies, the management of NGOs, leadership of, and things like that. So, but that's the world I come from. I'm involved in setting up an, an NGO, which was in track, and so a lot of learning through that as well. And over the last, particularly the last 10 years, I've done a lot of consulting with a whole raft of NGOs from whether it's Action A through to much smaller southern NGOs um, to some UK charities. So, so that's the world I'm coming from. And through all that work, I've always had a lot of contact with leaders. And go, going back to my sort of early interest in entrepreneurship, um, always had an interest in the way um, NGOs are set up and where they're led. And so really what I want to talk through today is just some of my thinking around that and the voyage in a way that I've been on. And the voyage that I think leadership is going to have to be going on over the next 10, 15 years. So what I want to talk about today is Initially, it's the context we're operating in, and then to take that on into some thoughts about leadership, and to end up with getting some, to raise some issues about how one should rethink leadership, and also obviously in terms of leadership development. Um, and this isn't just something that the uh, development sector struggles with. If you talk to people at LBS, you talk to people at Judge Business School, you talk to people at SAI, they're all having the same struggle. How do you actually get leadership? Uh, and leadership development so that it actually works. And people are trying different routes to it. Um, so what I'm drawing on isn't just merely uh, sort of just the practitioner, but it's also drawing on some of the broader research and experience around leadership. So if you can bear with me, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, hopefully no more. So by 5.30, I'll shut up. Um, so if you can hang in there long enough. Um, Clearly the world I'm working in is this very complicated world. I think one of the things that comes out very strongly is how vibrant and how diverse it is. Um, you know, when one thinks NGOs, you occasionally think of the monsters, the Oxfam's, the Saves, the World Visions. Um, but it's clearly a much larger, uh, much more vibrant sector. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in Ethiopia with the fistula work that Hamlin does, going through all sorts of interesting traumas, runs hospitals, runs clinics. Um, in Ethiopian terms, a very big southern NGO, but quite clearly all sorts of issues are on there. You get things like BRAC, you know, the largest NGO in the world, employs, what, 125,000 people? Huge success. And if you wanted an example of a successful leader, look at Abed at BRAC. And, you know, Abed and the way he drove BRAC, grew BRAC, and the whole sort of issues about how he makes it appear to be highly participative, and yet hugely hierarchical. There's a very interesting implied hierarchy that goes on in Brack. But as a, as a big organisation, a southern organisation, working in, what is it, 20 countries now? Yeah, you know, if you go to Tanzania, yeah. I've just been in Wanza, in western Tanzania, one of the first thing I saw was a sign for Brack. You know, so it's not just a, you know, so again, when we think NGOs, we think development agencies, it's a much more, as I say, um, vibrant sector. Um, I always like um, Human Appeal, which sort of popped. Anyone from Manchester here? 
you know, who's, why, why haven't we got more development agencies from Leeds and Manchester? Why is it always London and Oxford? I mean, we're the ones from Edinburgh. We're the ones from wherever it may be, Liverpool. And human appeals popped out of South Southern Manchester, growing incredibly quickly as a Muslim-based um, NGO doing, you know, interesting and quirky things around the world. And, you know, have, as with all the Muslim charities, has all sorts of issues associated with that. But there's a speed of growth that one sees in a thing like human appeal. Um, and you know, compare that with something like the Welfare Association, which I worked in Palestine. Again, major um, sort of sort of sense of national health service. So I think one of the things that we need to be recognising is when we think NGO, we don't just think about the monsters. The monsters are very big. We recognise that. And World Vision, you know, this is quite dated figures, but, you know, World Vision certainly got a turnover of well over three billion now. Um, and you look at the big confederal structures like Oxfam International, you look at, you know, SAVE, and those sort of big organisations. So again, it's those are the ones that the sort of public think about, and in a way they've become too big. Um, they're losing a certain degree of legitimacy. And partly of that because obviously the growth of NGOs in the sun. But the other thing that's happening is the sheer number of new NGOs that are being registered year on year. If you look at the Charity Commission data, there's something like 500 new international, what they call emergency and welfare organisations being registered in this country every year. It's a very vibrant sector. They're all going to be competing. They're not all little mum and pop sure. Some of them are, you know, certainly turn over of three or four hundred thousand in their first year of operation. Whether it's doing things in Syria, whether it's doing things in Myanmar, whether it's doing things around Alzheimer's overseas. So I think we've got to recognise that it's a very, very vibrant sector. And when we think NGO, don't just think about Save and Oxfam. And, and, the, and the big operations. They are very big, they're very impressive. Um, but as I say, it's a, it's a much more vibrant sector. So that's where I'm sort of starting from, is just the sheer vibrancy, the sheer diversity, let alone the sheer number of non-profits that one comes across, whether it's in India, whether it's South Africa, whether it's Tanzania. So it's, that's the sort of world that I'm operating. The other point I'd like to emphasize is that if you look at the literature, you look at the research, you do a Master's in Development Studies. The great bulk of that work is around either the context, the politics, the economics of it. There's a huge amount of literature on, on the context and po aid policy and economic policy and the political dialogue around that. Um, there are a whole bunch of courses they call Development Management, which are really about the World Bank and really about how multilaterals work. Um, but there's a, there's a whole, you know, whether you go to IDS, you go to IEA, whether you go to... Um, and similarly, there's a lot of research. One goes back to the work of Robert Chambers. You go way back before that in community-based work on implementing projects, implementing programs, how they engage with local communities. All the issues around programmatic work. Huge amount of research, huge amount of literature. And the thing that I find extraordinary is how little there is written about how few courses there are if you were out wanting to get a job managing an NGO, being a manager in a development agency, being a manager in BIFID. Where do you go? Do you go to Cranfield and do an MBA? Do you go to LBS and do an even more expensive MBA? Well, where do you get this training? Or is it that you're a jolly good vet and you've been around long enough and therefore you're put in a management position? Now, where is this process of development? And that's true in the NGO sector. Where is it? Went way back, I can remember trying to set up when I was at Cranfield, trying to set up an MBA for, for NGOs. One of the things that was very clear from the market research, people said, yes, there's a market for it, but we want to do it at a brand name institution. We don't want to do it at South Bank. We don't want to do it at, you know, wherever it is, Telford Tech. We want to do it at LBS. We want to do it at Warwick. Now, if you do it at Warwick, you do it at LBS, it's going to cost you, what, 40, 50,000 a year. You know, the reality, and that's where the CAS thing has been interesting. So it's one of the few places that a brand name management school has cross subsidized a lot of non profit management courses. And we are the largest provider of non profit management postgraduate courses in Europe now. But it's cross subsidized. Um, but there's a real issue about where is the research, where is the teaching for that circle around leadership and management. 
And that's the world that I've been in for the last 20 years. And as I say, it's quite a lonely world. Where are the academics that I could talk to about leadership, say, in NGOs or leadership in different? Who's doing that research? Very, very few. You know, and I go to, I'm going to the States to try and find. So it's quite a lonely forum. And yet, you know, we've got this very vibrant sector. We've got all these development agents. We've got all these donor agencies. We've got all these NGOs, you know, which are very complicated organizations to run. They're working in some of the most difficult places in the world uh, with very weak infrastructure very often, poor systems, highly volatile political situations, a lot of cross-cultural issues. You know, managing Coca-Cola is a dog compared with managing programs in Duffel. And I think we've got to recognize the sheer complexity, whether it's running a foundation operating overseas, whether it's a donor agency, but particularly an NGO. You know, and if people who are working in NGOs do wake up in the middle of the night, sometimes they're sort of stressed out of their brain blocks, it's understandable. You know, you've got limited resources, you're competing for funds, you've got often as I say, issues about infrastructure, issues about systems, all sorts of issues. And that's again the world that I'm sort of coming from. So it's really that circle around organisation and leadership that I've been operating and I just want to sort of highlight. I suppose my plea to you is, you know, please introduce me to other people who are interested in that, in doing research in that area.